have here with us today Professor Janet Carsten, Professor of Social and Cultural Anthropology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. She is a renowned scholar in the area of kinship studies as well as gender and personhood. Uh, she has published widely, and some of her important works includes The Culture of Relatedness and After Kinship. Professor Carsten's research has focused mainly on Malaysia and Britain. Uh, welcome, Professor Carsten. Very nice to be here. Um, so my first question is a kind of a broad question about kinship, um, the past and the present and the future. Um, kinship has been central to the discipline of both British and American uh, anthropology since its inception. Why do you think kinship continues to be an important area for students in the social sciences? Yeah, it's uh, an interesting question. I think um, actually kinship had a bit of a lapse in the 1970s uh, and certainly when I was a student when it was not uh, the most fashionable or interesting thing to do. Uh, in contrast perhaps to gender studies which seemed very lively and interesting but the curious thing was that um, through the 1980s uh, and the rise in gender studies in anthropology um, there was a, a perhaps slightly unexpected turn back to kinship because uh, anthropologists, particularly like um, Jane Collier and Sylvia Yanagisaku, realized that you couldn't study kinship in isol uh, gender in isolation and that you had to understand it as uh, mutually producing and produced by uh, uh, kinship. So that kind of produced a kind of turn back to kinship, but also partly. Um, the answer to that question, I think, is ethnographic in that when anthropologists do fieldwork, and particularly when they look at um, trajectories, life trajectories of women, but also men, of course, um, you know, kinship comes into the equation. And whether fashionable or not, when you start to do fieldwork, uh, very often anthropologists realize um, perhaps wasn't what they expected, but kinship relations are really fundamental to the topics that anthropologists are interested in, which includes religion and politics, actually. So, so you were talking about the lapse in the 1960s mm -hmm. and the 1970s, and you actually were part of the revival of kinship studies in the academy. Um, and you introduced this concept of relatedness, um, and you argued that uh, you have to kind of um, uh, move away from what was considered at that time sort of a Eurocentric view of kinship is sort of um, embedded in sort of biological ties. But you also argued that the dichotomy between sort of biology and um, the social distinction had, you know, you need to move away from that and think about kinship a bit differently. Could you tell us a little mm. bit about your work at that time? So, um, again, that the answer to that question has two strands, if you like, okay. and one is ethnographic. So it starts from the first field work I did for my doctoral studies, which was uh, in a Malay village, uh, where I spent enormous amounts of time uh, inside uh, people's houses with women. Uh, and I started to build up a picture of what kinship was, beginning from um, first principles, if you like. Uh, so without really taking you know, what I was taught about kinship, this is what kinship is or what isn't, but really trying to understand kinship from the point of view of the people I studied. So that began with the importance of the house, which is uh, very symbolically and socially significant in Southeast Asia, as in many other parts of the world, of course, um, with the importance of uh, women to kinship uh, relations and how women produce and reproduce kinship over time historically, and uh, the importance of food, the food that's consumed in houses, in ideas about bodily substance. So that was one ethnographic um, strand to that um, and thinking about what kinship means. And then it seemed to me that um, the, word, the analytic term kinship came with a lot of baggage already pre-prepared. And there I was really following in the lines of um, David Schneider's work particularly, uh, where he had argued that uh, there was a kind of ethnocentric presumption 
uh, in kinship studies that uh, the distinction between the biological and the social could be taken as given and that everywhere uh, biology was kind of fundamental to kinship. And he argued that that was ethnocentric and it didn't necessarily hold true everywhere, for example, among the Yapis who he studied in Micronesia. So uh, that was another part. But coming at the same time, and really although Schneider himself argued for the kind of comprehensive demolition of kinship in anthropology, um, curiously, many of his students um, were very interested in kinship. And so there was a kind of feminist strand in kinship studies that came partly out of Schneider's stable and the work that he supervised among his graduate students. So people like um, uh, Kath Weston and Susan McKinnon and various other people uh, from Chicago. And one of the really important things that work started by Schneider showed was that uh, biology in itself is a cultural symbol. And Schneider showed that for North America or attempted to um, and so the distinction between the biological and social couldn't be taken as given. And therefore, um, there was a whole body of work to do to try and um, deconstruct uh, the term biology. And so another part of my work has been, uh, which has continued until now, looking at ideas about bodily substance and the contribution of ideas about biology was one part of that. But really, again, going back to first principles and thinking, for example, about blood, which we all think we know what blood is. Uh, but in fact, um, blood differs historically and uh, geographically and culturally uh, in different areas. And notions about blood are very, very interesting once you start to try and unpack them. And that's uh, one of the things that I've been doing. So there's a quite strong um, feminist strand in kind of the denaturalization of kinship and of biology and of biological substance um, that has been going on really since uh, early 1980s that has been uh, very important in the work that I've done. And so relatedness has really, um, was a term that I kind of coined uh, in something I wrote around 2000, that um, was really an attempt to, to say, let's just put the term kinship on hold uh, and go back to first principles and look at how people themselves in different places, different historical eras, talk about kinship and enact kinship relation uh, and think about that as relatedness. You could use sociality or some other term, uh, but I used relatedness. And then since then, I've actually gone back to kinship because um, I'm not very dogmatic about what term you use. But more important, I think, is the principle that you can't assume what substance or biology or uh, the house or any of those things mean without investigating it ethnographically, and that's what's really important. So, like you were saying, you in your work you've used key symbols to illustrate the ways, um, the different ways in which kinship uh, is symbolized in different cultures. So, mm. you talked about your first work with your PhD research, which looked at. Um, uh, food and eating together, and then thereafter you have talked about sort of the house, then collective memory, and then ghosts more recently. Um, could you talk a little bit about the kinds of the ways in which you've used those symbols and its significance, perhaps? Mm. So I think um, I found those, uh, then of course, not just symbols. That's the important point. Uh, they are symbolically elaborated, but I've found things like eating together and the house. Um, memories, of course, somewhat different. Um, so it's more abstract and more difficult to kind of pin down um, as, as key ways of getting into um, what makes kinship important for people. Uh, and um, really, have been important as a way of unlocking very simple terms that anybody can grasp. The most uh, beginning student in anthropology can understand 
what it means to eat a meal uh, in their own culture. And you can start to unpack the difference between, for example, a full meal that you eat at home with your family and a snack that you might have on a train or on a bus or at the cinema. Uh, and why the different kinds of food are different from each other and what that signifies. So the significant difference between boiled food uh, and fried food, uh, between the things that you drink, alcohol, and fruit juice, for example, and why different kinds of food tend to be elaborated in different ways, and the messages they carry about co-substantiality, about the possible risk of pollution or of being poisoned. Um, so you can get into all kinds of interesting areas, witchcraft, um, because often food is a means for introducing witchcraft to people. Uh, and so... Um, the house or eating a meal, the way um, a house space is divided tells you all sorts of things about, as Bourdieu showed, uh, about the relations of people who live together in one house, or their relations with animals, the different relations between generations, between uh, males and females, and so on. Uh, and so they've been kind of keys to unlocking what's really important about social relations, things that are constant across cultures, but uh, also things that vary between cultures. Um, and that's been very important. And then um, moving on to slightly more abstract terms like substance and memory, um, that ha really has come out of the earlier work. So from, from uh, food comes substance, from uh, other media become, well, I mean, actually, if you think back to anyone's own childhood, um, one of the most important, powerful memories probably is about the family meal and how you ate your family meals. Uh, and you have those memories. I have them. Uh, and they're very significant to people. So you can go from, and equally, the house space, you know, the, the memories of childhood that are really powerful often incorporate the house that you lived in as a small child and you may not remember it precisely but you remember some quite significant things about it and where you were in that space in relation to other people. So um, memory and substance probably come out of those um, key areas. Thank you. So just picking up on what you were talking about in terms of food and sharing meals as a family and because your work um, has been sort of in Malaysia. I remember watching a documentary once about something called mamak culture in mm -hmm. Malaysia, where it, uh, so this kind of tendency for families to go and hang out in malls and eat, um, and that was sort of integral to Malaysia being Malay. Right. Um, so I was wondering whether you had sort of thought about kind of moving away from sort of home cooked food and sharing meals in the home to a very sort of globalized environment of the mall, very public, but, um, whether that has any kind of impact in the way people um, think about kinship and family. Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I haven't myself done research on that, but um, when we teach about kinship, certainly that's something that I would want to bring in. I mean, I think one of the things that you would want to look at is, is exactly as you suggested, who eats together uh, in the mall or anywhere else. So um, there are interesting questions to ask, you know, are we getting groups of friends hanging out together or work colleagues taking lunch together in a, in a mall? Um, or uh, is it more family groups going um, as, as families or together as more extended families, bringing in more people. So, so the questions, I think, to some extent, remain the same. Um, you know, we're interested in who eats with whom, what they eat and how they eat, and what are the differences, because um, part of what's interesting about food consumption, of course, is the different modes that you, you can um, consume food and the different uh, social relations that it carries along with it, that it strengthens or reduces. Um, so that's something that you would want to look at. So in other words, are people eating less family meals at home or not really? Is this just an added-on uh, version 
Um, so that's the kind of question that I'd be interested in. So you kind of um, touched on sort of new forms of sociality that are emerging. Mm. Um, and I was interested in asking you kind of how social media um, has played into sort of emphasizing different ways of relating to people, kind of the intensity with which, for instance, people um, communicate with each other, say, on Facebook or Instagram. And um, I was wondering whether you, know, whether you had any thoughts about how these kinds of relatedness are impacting on people's kinship ties and whether, we, um, whether this is kind of part of a continuation in some ways of sort of people wanting to sort of document, um, have memories of themselves as people uh, within their social networks? Interesting question. Uh, my, my sense of a lot of, that, which may be wrong, uh, a lot of the uh, new social media is that intrinsic to them is the idea that they should be and they are ephemeral, so that this is not stuff that's meant to last. Um, so it's a huge increase in the quantity of communication and, of course, in the modes of communication. But um, I think the question that's really open is the, the long-term effects, the, the lastingness of um, some of that stuff. So will there be a record of Facebook, uh, you know, communications in 20 years' time of the ones that happened 20 years before? And my sense is probably not, because that's the point of them, that they should be ephemeral. Um, in which case, they're, again, like the food question, the interesting question is to ask about uh, the coexistence of different modes of communication. So another, another similar question question, but I think perhaps uh, even more interesting, I mean, family photographs, which for a very long time have provided a kind of arch a very personal archive for people, but also a more uh, an, an archive in the academic sense mm -hmm. of changing family relations around the world. Uh, and photographs, I mean, interestingly, people often say about their family photographs that that would be the one thing, they, the first thing they want to rescue from their burning house. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and they're very, very precious to people. So perhaps in contrast to Facebook communications, which are possibly less so. Um, but these are open questions. So, so then, you know, what happens with the, um, again, the huge increase in the amount of photography people are doing, the digitization, you know, so will there still be the same kinds of records? And there, I think my hunch is that there will be, that the preservation of family photographs will continue to be important, although selectivity <laughs> might uh, start to be an issue at some point. But um, so, so I'm not convinced that uh, relations profoundly change because of these media and I think it's more important to look at what people are doing with the media and their longevity. Uh, okay. Of course, it, just because they're ephemeral doesn't mean they're unimportant. I mean, they may matter, but briefly. Okay. Uh, and, and to whom do they matter? Uh, you know, that's another question. And what kinds of relationships do they flourish? Um, and one thing is, of course, over, the, over geographic distances. So that's an interesting Thing where it's much more possible to communicate all sorts of stuff over very long geographic distances. And in fact, distance doesn't matter that much mm -hmm. in those contexts. So okay. that uh, may have some long-term significance. I mean, one thing that has struck me about Facebook and the whole sort of business of friending people mm. so that they're linked to you is that there's sort of a blurring of the boundaries between the ki different kinds of relationships yeah. you have. So, you know, so you have people saying, my grandmother is now my friend on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and then you think about the kinds of things that you share. Yeah. Um, that's sort of all, all parts of your life or, or what you choose yeah. to share. It then becomes everybody's, um, it's for everybody to consume in some ways. So the kind of hierarchical relationships, for example, that you may have maintained with your parents, with grandparents, aunts and uncles, which are then opposed to friends, for example, uh, kind of get blurred in that 
in that space. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And I think particularly um, with parents and children, where the, the surveillance regime of parents or um, supervision uh, gets very kind of blurred. And there's an idea that, you know, parents should not be really looking at their teenage children's Facebook communication because they might, you know, there's a, there is a boundary question, as you say, uh, there. Uh, and it's like having conversations that are unsuitable uh, in certain relationships. So um, it will be interesting to see, I think, how that develops and whether the boundary-keeping mechanisms actually become more significant rather than less significant. That there's something about Facebook that promotes a kind of democratization mm. of relations, but that slowly but surely boundary-keeping mechanisms will creep in, which is kind of what you might expect, in fact. Um, thank you, Professor Carsten, for that really interesting discussion on sort of the the history of kinship and what it's sort of how it has evolved over time and its present configurations. And uh, thank you for being with us today. Mm -hmm.